All right. We should be live. Yeah, look at that. Little little delay as normal. So uh, so hello everybody. Um, you got a, an interesting uh, opportunity here to kind of see a little bit of the behind the scenes making of our YouTube lives. I figured I got to do this work anyway. So maybe I'll see if it's worth capturing a recording and maybe you guys see some value. Uh, hello everybody. Um, we got a, an interesting uh, opportunity here to kind of see a little... So what you just heard was that was my mic check. Um, so one of the things I like to do before one of these events, just because God knows all kinds of crazy things can happen uh, day of, is I do like to check all my hardware, right? So I am actually monitoring the feed that you see on another PC as a login. Um, and uh, it's interesting, they changed the screen on me a little bit, it looks like as to what I see. So that's another reason why I do this stuff because YouTube likes to update stuff in the studios all the time. I use a piece of software called OBS, which is a um, really cool piece of software if you've if never had a chance to play with it. It is a shareware um, studio and it's how I create the content and make my different scenes and whatnot. So like to give you an example, if I want you to see another camera angle that's actually established and set up as a scene. So here I come in, I have couple different angle views. You can see my control, there's my hand waving. You can see I have a probe in the machine, part blank. So I do all that through OBS, which is, uh, which is pretty, pretty neat how the whole thing works. Um, and then I, I just kind of drive between the screenshots you see over here through my keyboard. Let me jump back. I do use hotkeys, so sometimes it wreaks a little havoc on my uh, Internet Explorer because it thinks that it's seeing that as a hotkey like I wanted to change screens. Um, typically once I get started I will usually kind of hide this, um, put it off to the side. Sometimes I do a split screen which is sometimes helpful if I want to see both my OBS Studio and what's kind of going on in case somebody wants to chat with me or whatnot in, uh, in the YouTube stream. So I am a one-man band. I don't have the luxury of having a big production crew behind me. Um, so yeah, it's uh, I'm driving it all, <laughs> running all the cameras, running the content. It's kind of fun. So what we're getting ready for here is um, not only in checking my camera feeds, but I wanted to check the part program I'm going to be using for the event day of, which the event happens to actually be tomorrow. So nothing like waiting to the last minute, it's which is I, what I usually do. <laughs> yeah, time is always a precious commodity these days. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to set up and cut my part. So, you know, we're not going to show the setup of the job during the event. I'll have it all pre-established. Um, so you might, might get a kick out of kind of seeing the steps it takes. I've talked about this material certainly in other videos. Um, but Hey, again, it's a behind the scenes. This is the stuff I got to do. So you get to check it out. So one of the first things I'm going to do here is I'm just going to grab my programs off of my USB. Now, I like to, uh, depending on how I'm programming it, I like to do a lot of that stuff at my PC. I'm kind of lazy. I like to sit down. So I will um, use either our, I'm just going to drop all these in the part programs folder. I have a YouTube live folder there. I can probably leave it in there. Uh, sure. Okay, so I like to use our uh, digital twin software to do a lot of this stuff to kind of mock it up so I can do it at my desk. Um, I happen to be now using our uh, Run My Virtual Machine software, uh, a little more powerful than maybe some of you are used to seeing in CineTrain, but I still got to bring it all over here and set it up and run it. So I can, uh, I can switch over to another camera view if you guys want to get a little bit of a close up. Maybe not just stare at my back. So this is the program we're going to run and to kind of work with the content and what I want to show tomorrow, I broke it up into a couple different stages. So, you know, the, 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 the whole point of the uh, feed and speed video is to show you how to do feed and speed calculations, but I wanted to tie in some live examples 
to it, I thought there would be some value. So first piece of the program, and uh, we can try simulating, but I think I gotta build my tools. I haven't done that yet, so it's probably gonna give me alarm. First piece of the program is gonna show more of a traditional tool path. Um, yeah, I gotta create my tools. So let's, let's build some tools first. So this is a common step that I would normally have to do if I'm not maintaining the same tools in my library. So this one came out of Mastercam. Um, I posted this out of a cam system because I wanted to, to use uh, a little more advanced toolpath strategies later in the event. Um, I wouldn't be able to use this or NX, um, kind of six of one, half dozen of the other. Um, can't say necessarily why I chose Mastercam over NX. I, I, I you know, bounce between the two, kind of whatever I feel like that day. But in this case, I get a list of my tools. I'm using tool names. You can see that here with the T equals. So I'm gonna grab that name and I'm going to uh, kind of drop it in to my tool management side. The first tool I'm using is a half inch tool. So I can kind of come over and see, do I even have a half inch tool in my library? So everything you see with the number, those are tools in pocket locations. So right now it does not appear that I have any tool with uh, you know, the, that geometry in the current library, so I can build a new tool. Um, I guess I'm gonna have to build up a tool. I thought I had a half inch tool set up. Yeah, what's that one in the back? Oh, maybe that's my 3 ace tool. So what I'm looking for is I'm quickly looking at my pockets. Nope, I have pocket four should be. Oh yeah, there it is. I do have a half inch general. See, I'm staring at it and didn't even notice it. So in a case like this, there's a little different, you know, naming strategy between what I posted out of the cam system, and what I used here. A lot of times I like to update the, the CAD CAM program as opposed to um, using the name coming out of the CAD CAM program. Because if I'm using this job, this tool in other jobs, I don't want to lose it. So I'm just going to do a quick control C for a copy. And now I'll jump back with program. I can mark my name and hit paste. That'll update my NML half inch. So that tool should be good. Now, if you look, I'm also using a three quarter inch ML and I know I don't have that one in there because I haven't even built that tool yet. I have it sitting on the bench right now. So I'm gonna copy that. We're gonna jump back over to our tools and I'm gonna see what I got. now. You know, sometimes I'm, yeah, I do have a lot of tools in this carousel right now. So I'm gonna remove a tool. Maybe I'm gonna remove my thread mill. Depending on your machine, um, some have um, loading and unloading stations. This is a small machine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna tool change to my thread mill, which is probably that one right there and we're gonna get that out. So what I do in my machine is to make myself room, I will tool change to it. Now I have the probe in there and I will put it back in in a second. Once I have all my tools set up, then I usually find my zeros. So that's our thread mill. So in this case, I'll manually remove through the spindle, a little rack down here. And then I am going to go unload that tool, right? So I'll do a tool zero, clear the spindle. I could have put the other tool in that pocket now, but I think that's a little dangerous myself. So what I like to do is I'll come in, go to my offset table and I'll do an unload. Now I didn't want to kill those values because I still have that tool down below. So in this case now, um, I'm going to be able to create a new tool. So I'm going to create a three quarter inch tool and I had copied it. So I should still have it. And we're going to get rid of the suggested name that can always be shut off by the way. Control V there's my three quarter inch end mill. All right. Now when I'm, when I'm filling out the tool and I already got a chance to build the tool, the way my machine is set up, my tool offsets, I work from spindle face or gauge line. But when I'm gonna set my tools, I wanna to take a rough measurement. So I'm just grabbing a tape measure. That was, I'm gonna do a double check because I'm talking and doing this stuff. But I wanna say, yeah, that was three and three quarter, just shy of four. 
So I'm going to give that a positive length, 3.750. Now I have this XY components because I've showed you guys in, in other videos, um, you know, doing interpolation turning. Traditionally, if I was never interpolation turning with this machine, I would not worry about having those fields commissioned, but I had set those up for that. So your machines probably don't have that. Now that this tool is there, I need to physically put it into the carousel. So the easiest thing at this point I find is to just do another false tool change. He's gonna go grab it, and then I'm going to drop said tool into my spindle. Voila, it's in there. Um, touching off the tool, I'm gonna to use my, my presetter since I gave it a length. I can go right in and measure this tool. So I'm going to do a length auto. Um, we have some pretty cool options here. I could show you real fast. Uh, let's go over to, you can, you can check individual teeth if you want to. I'm not really all that concerned about the diameter for what we're doing today. Um, so I'm just gonna check the, the length. I'm gonna leave my offset as a strategy. Um, this way it'll actually offset depending on the diameter in relation to the puck size. Um, if the tool diameter is larger than the puck, it'll offset by the radius of the cutter. Um, it'll make that choice. Uh, and then you can always modify that as well if you wanted to. So simply cycle start. I like to initiate everything, my override down. This way I can verify that my probe turned on. She'll start feeding down. I can throttle it up. All right, there we go. Now it's in a feeding measurement. So my machine's uh, calibrated to uh, move at two inches a minute during the measuring cycle. That tends to give me, with this probe, um, most consistent measurements that I've seen. Okay, so I had said 3.750, it measured out at 3.680. That's pretty good for a tape measure. Um, I would certainly go grab and check my other tool, which is my half inch tool. I think it was in pocket four. You notice I'm not leaving the screen. You can do tool changes right from inside that tool auto measure screen. So this way, it just saves me a little bit of time. I'm not jumping through screens. Um, and it does automatically come down. So you wouldn't want to use this for the loading portion. I mean, I have seen guys do it. Um, to me, it's a little risky because I'd have to abort the machine and then shove the tool into the spindle. So I personally would, uh, would do it the way I showed you, but a lot of it's personal preference. Okay, so I wasn't paying attention, but uh, this way I just know I have an updated tool length in case something changed. You know, my machine sits around from, from time to time. So uh, I do want to check my mic real quick to make sure everything still sounds good. Oh, look, I'm already getting my uh, closed captioning over here. And yeah, I hear my mic sounds good. Sweet. All right, so before I run a job, obviously that's first step. I want to set my tools. Now I got to set my part zero. Now I did do it earlier. Um, I'll do it again just for uh, just for the repetition's sake, you guys get a chance to see it too. So I really love having a tool presetter. This is, to me, well worth every bit of money a uh, manufacturer could charge for one. Um, I happen to have Marpos on here. I've, I've used all the different brands. Um, have had a lot of luck with the Marpos presetter. Um, so since I said I do already have a position set, I could actually just rapid to it. I'll just show you what I used um, as far as oops, a probing strategy, what cycles I used. We have a nice library of cycles there. All right. So, so here you would normally just kind of eyeball this and jog this down into position. And then inside of our measuring work fee cycles, I really need to do two steps, right? I need to find the top of my part. So I'm gonna use this for a Z. Now I've already indicated in my vise, so I'm not gonna go and try to adjust skew or anything. So I like to use the standard, the straight edge kick, which is always there. And that will allow me to come down and measure the top of my part. Now, obviously I had pre-selected 
G54 earlier, which is matching my part program. If not, I would have had to load it. I could load that here if I wanted to, or in the TSM screen. And now we have a cycle, which is our spigot or our boss measuring cycle that I used to give me four points because I'm working from the center on this part. Obviously, if I was working maybe from the upper left end edge, I could do everything in the previous cycle. But in this case, I'm going to use the spigot cycle because I'm working on the center. So the cycle is pretty straightforward. I'm just going to come down, give it a width, give it a length, give it an incremental drop from wherever I was sitting. So that's why it's an unsigned value. Um, down below, I could tell it that the middle of it is something other than zero. I wanted mine to be zero. And then just uh, let her roll around. We've done quite a bit of optimization on this machine to the motion. You see those nice little rapids to the middle and whatnot, trying to uh, streamline the measuring cycles. So, um, you know, we, uh, we have a lot of parameters, <laughs> I will admit. And with that, it gives you a lot of control um, for sure. But uh, there is a lot of onus on the OEM as to how he sets it up. So like if your machine's not doing that, it was really how the OEM decided to kind of optimize the measuring. Doesn't mean it can't be changed, but I would always refer to the OEM at that point because he might have had a, a good reason why he did what he did on the setup. All right, so I wanna, I wanna prove out my part. I gotta make sure my tool paths are good. So now we're gonna go run it. So I copied it before you saw me go in. I can certainly open up the file maybe do a quick simulation. Now out of Mastercam, I have them putting in the blank for me already, so it's gonna make all of my tool path already work, which is quite nice. I don't have to go in and modify the G-code. So this is what I was talking about, more of the traditional kind of tool path strategy. This is a, a very uh, standard, long time used, planar style tool path, right? I'm, I'm working, I would whittle down planes so I threw a program stop here because that'll be the first piece of our demo. And then I'm going to show you guys a theory called chip thinning when we go into the event. So I wanted to do more of an adaptive milling or trichoidal. This isn't trichoidal, but it's where adaptive milling came from type of strategy. So here I'm doing a very small radial engagement. I want to say I used 15% um, to cut said part of this feature. Now, normally in a plane by plane, this is probably going to take longer, uh, even though I'm using a much higher feed rate than the other. But with this strategy, I could have taken full depth of cut, no problem, where um, pushing 50% of the cutter in a radial engagement um, and then clearing, that could have exceeded the capabilities, certainly of the machine or the tool or vice versa. Um, so those are obviously the benefits. Generally, adaptive milling, people always think, boy, I can go right to adaptive. Um, you know, if you don't have a lot of depth of material to remove, um, so it's like a shallow pocket, it could take longer. So, you know, do your due diligence. Don't always assume that the latest and greatest strategy is the most proficient for the job you're doing. Um, in, in a lot of cases, maybe not. Like this one's gonna take significantly longer to cut. Again, if I was to add the two operations that the, the other one would have taken to the one, now I start to beat it. So, you know, think about your, your geometry when you come up with some of these strategies. So everything looks pretty good here. You know, certainly I don't need to run the whole thing to completion. I was really just checking to make sure my zeros looked okay. I've already simulated this externally in my digital twin. So I'm gonna get right to, to running. Now I am gonna be using some flood coolant here for the pocket. I will uh, I'll get them all ready at time. So let us fire this bad boy up. Big advocate of always starting everything with a feed rate override on zero. Give yourself some reaction time. Okay. So she's coming down to a pre-position move. And then my flood's coming on. So I'm going to stop her there. And I will turn on my flood. So I have two different strategies on this machine. I do have um, around the spindle. So... If you see here, you know, I can do something like that. Problem is it does splash a lot and I have a camera. So I'm going to maybe use my single lock line and we'll push all of our material kind of away. Hopefully I 
to minimize my uh, splashes. All right, let's see, see what it sounds like. So this is traditional with a 50% step over, um, normal traditional speed and feed calculations. You see, I'm in aluminum, I'm running 20 inches per minute, pretty common, non-coated carbide. Big thing I want to flood in here, later we're probably gonna switch over to my mister uh, so we can see a little more, is chip evacuation, right? I wanna make sure I try to clear as many of those chips as I can. Certainly the more coolant, the better, but it's always fun. I always gotta play around with those different things when I'm uh, doing videos, because I gotta also think about the video feed, right? Don't wanna hammer the sucker with coolant, not too bad, a couple little splashes on the top camera. The other one's way back, so uh, that one usually doesn't get coolant on it so much. It sounds pretty good. It's taking a decent chip. I think I'm doing like a fourth out chip based on the calculation. And that's where I, I never like these types of toolpath strategies is on that you know, radial step over. They have a tendency to take a full width of cut there almost when they step over, right? It's not completely full width, but. All right, so that is gonna be my first toolpath. So I am going to um, just stop my spindle for a second. I'm gonna stop my flood. So on the event, we're gonna shut this off. But for now, because I'm testing out the program, I'm going to keep on going. I just wanted to clear some of the chips out of that pocket. And now we can fire up our coolant, fire up our spindle. Uh, hmm. Let me do this. All right, so now we're going to use, why is my RPM lower? Hold on. Oh, because I cranked down my override. Ah, that was me. Operator error. All right, so now we're using a uh, more of an adaptive milling strategy. And chip thinning, so you can see I'm running at a much higher feed rate. I'm running at 88 inches per minute, as opposed to uh, what we were running at before. Of course, there's a nice big old uh, big old droplet right in front of the camera. Let me uh, get to a portion where I feel I can feed holder. I can wipe that off. Have to clear it tomorrow. Pay attention. So if done properly, the, uh, the chip load should be the same with the increased feed rate and leveraging chip thinning. So i.e. if I was, uh, for example, oh, i.e. All right, there I can pull her off for a second. That was, Let me grab a little. I wonder why. Look, I got a big, I don't know, that's weird. Everything else looks clear. Oh, I'm just seeing the, the cool one, I think. All right, let's try it. Getting a little bit of recutting. This flood isn't the greatest. I'm gonna think I'm gonna move that camera further back for tomorrow. Maybe I'll use the other flood strategy. I get a much better chip evacuation when I, uh, I don't even can see it really. So if I run this as opposed to, maybe I'll run this back a little bit. Let's move this back, see what that looks like. 
I like to try to keep this thing as far away, but yet not mess up your perspective. Let me just see. Uh, not so bad, not so bad. Funny, I'm getting a, it looks like a swatch there. It's kinda, well, maybe it's okay. You see what it looks like. Oh, it takes a second to. It's funny, there's a delay between what I see and when I make the adjustments and what you guys see. Oh, yeah, it looks pretty good. All right, so, like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crank up my other coolant. There you see, I can get some really good chip evacuation there. So let's fire her up. How much better it sounds. I'm sure you guys can hear that. We're now getting those chips out of there. There's no, uh, there's, there's certainly no uh, substitution for really su sufficient flood coolant flow, right? Just volume. I actually increased the pressure of this pump. I swapped out this pump to a higher volume pump. Um, this isn't a high pressure, but what I, would, what I say at least, but it's kind of a high volume. Um, I forget the ratings on the pump, but the, uh, there was no way I could even run this, this kind of coolant strategy with the uh, original factory pump. So Fryer was a big help. They, uh, they were able to help me uh, get, a, get a better pump for the machine. But I like this better and it's like we're staying okay. Funny, I, I swear I see a funny looking kind of uh, spot on that video. I may try one of my other cameras. So this then shows how you would really use the strategy, which would be a full depth of cut. I needed to also clear out the outside because the next thing I'm going to show is um, calculation of feed at the cutter edge. So I needed something with some OD and ID radiuses that we could roll around. There you see us ripping it 88 inches a minute. I'm taking again a 15% radial engagement, full depth of cut, which in this profile happened to be a half inch. Oh, look, we even got some questions. I hadn't even been uh, <laughs> looking at the questions. So uh, how to enable left side menu. Ah, so that is uh, specific to the commissioning of Cinemark One. Um, you can have it with just a toolbar. I want to say that's just an MD, but I have full side screen capability, so I can expand and contract. So that really has to be set up when they commission the control. I don't recall if this could be added on. You would need a Center America one for sure. Um, ship time, cycle time, um, I'd have to look. <laughs> I don't remember. Right now I'm really concentrating on you know, chip load and feed calculation. Uh, I am using a three flute cutter for this half inch end mill. Next tool is gonna to be a three quarter. Um, that one I just grabbed a four flute. I wanted a big radius more than anything else. Uh, yes, it is aluminum. Um, minimum quality lubrication with WD-40 or dedicated lubricant, any idea? So I do use a micro lube system. Actually, that's what I'm gonna turn on when we do this last pass. Um, I use the, uh, um, the AccuLube, sorry, I had a, had a little bit of a brain fart there. Um, I use the AccuLube system and I use their lubricant. They have, this is actually really good stuff. It's the AccuLube LB6100, um, super high lubricity to it. Um, I guess you could use WD-40. I've heard guys use vegetable oil in them. Um, I just use theirs. It uses so little, it lasts for like forever. Cool, so we have our little racetrack. Just showing off a couple different types of strategies. And now the last is gonna rip a three quarters end mill around the part. I'm not gonna go into all the details. You gotta come back tomorrow to see the, the different details as to why I'm doing what I'm doing, but at least I'll be able to finish up. So we'll do a tool change 
I am going to use my AccuLube system next. For the camera, it's great because it, uh, I don't have the obstruction I got out of the coolant. So we're going to come down. See, since I'm going to talk about, there you can hear the mister fired up. So we'll give it a little bit of lube there. When I started using the AccuLube, you know, there's a little sight glass on it and you see like a little drip. And you want a drip about every five seconds, five to seven seconds. It is very little fluid if you do it right. Okay, let me uh, crank up. Half inch down. Yeah, I probably didn't need to take such a big cut, but I think I left 50 thou. It's fine though for what we're doing. You know, what we're going to be talking about when we get to this section is uh, what happens in the corners. You know, when you maintain the same feed rate, I know I said I wasn't going to tell you, but I'll tell you. Um, you're actually reducing or reducing or increasing your chip load because if you think about the distance of path in an arc, it's bigger or smaller at the center of the cutter. So we're going to talk about calculating that and show you a couple cool features. But, uh, but anyway, so uh, yeah, it's all a little behind the scenes. Um, how long are we on for? Oh, about a half an hour. That's pretty cool. So there'll be more tomorrow for sure. Um, and then we'll probably let this video go live. You guys can check it out any other time. Um, hopefully people see the questions because I was answering without reading the questions. I think they do in post video. But anyway, hey, thanks for stopping by. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow, hopefully. All right, take it easy.